the little spinny thing. So once, yes, we are live now. So I'm going to show, uh, share the screen so you can all see the uh, bullying and harassment policy before we get started and then we will be good to go. In just a second. All right, can you all see the slide? No. No. But, no, I cannot. Um, okay. Okay. I think other people can. As I was like, I think other people can. I have it set straight on to me. Just that way I can sort of kind of watch what I'm doing, making sure it's making sense to all of you guys when I'm doing it. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing now and we can get started. Thank you, Sheva. Wonderful. So hi again, everyone. My name is Sheva Rose on Facebook. I am by Countess Seva Harafen's daughter, and this is Viking 201. Um, if you attended my first class, we sort of kind of went over the basic dress of what a woman would wear, what a kid would wear, and what a man would wear. Today, we're going to go over the more fun stuff. I mean, clothes are fun. Don't get me wrong. I like clothes. But the fun stuff is really what you get to wear with the clothes. So this is going to be a brief introduction and overview of Viking accessories, also known as cool sparkly bits that up your franchise game. All right. So we're going to just, we have a lot to cover today. So we're just going to sort of kind of jump into things and it's going to feel like we're jumping everywhere, but really what we're doing is like almost like head, shoulders, knees, and toes. We're going to sort of kind of go over a general specific area and then move and then just, they all become a cohesive unit. Um, normally I would do a fashion show, but because there is so much, half the class would be me putting stuff on and taking stuff off, putting stuff on, taking stuff off. And I don't want to do that. So if there's anything that you see that you have questions for, please be sure to type them in the chat. Amelia will be amazing. She'll read them off to me and I will answer them to the best I can. Um, the handouts, are not available yet. They will be by the time this is posted to the EK YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to that. Um, there are plenty of classes there for the arts and sciences, including uh, Viking 101, which is a precursor to this class. Um, so we're gonna jump right into it. <clears throat> okay, so we're wearing clothes. I like wearing clothes. Uh, however, I don't like just wearing basic. So I'm wearing a basic black shirt, black cardigan, which is cool when I'm going to the office. But when I'm going to an event, I want people to say, oh, I love her because she wears such and such. Or, oh, I love him because he wears such awesome Winnegas and garters. And wait, what are Winnegas and garters? We'll get there. But we're going to start with uh, clothing embellishment. So in uh, th there are fines and uh, different areas of seam treatments. Sheva, what's a seam treatment? I will tell you. So everyone has seams on their Viking clothes. Seam treatments are things that bring those seams a little bit more oomph. So instead of having just a basic seam where it's pieced together, you will get, or you can get, Oh, give me one second. I'm sorry. My phone is doing something funny and I need my phone because it helps my class. Yeah, we just lost the picture. Oh, you're back. You're good. There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. We're going to try and get that squared away. So these are your scene treatments. This is uh, one of my favorite apron dresses. One of my friends in the West made it for me. She's very talented. And I'm trying to do my best to not be a salesperson in my classes. It's really hard. So this is a seam treatment. Here are the seams on my dress. Here's the seam treatment. Now this can be done with just a basic running stitch. It can be done with a chain stitch, a Van Dyke stitch which is also known as Austin Stitch. It can be done with a herringbone. It can be a double herringbone. There are so many period stitches out there in the Viking era that you can use whatever combination makes your heart happy because they're your clothes. And because they're your clothes, do what you want to them. You know, unless you're actually like trying to prove authenticity, do what's gonna make you happy 
and do what's going to make you feel good wearing your clothes. So another thing that you can do to embellish your clothing are appliques. Uh, so a lot of people have seen um, a, a cloak, Viking square cloak that I made for Cullen. But this right here, this caftan was made for him. And it has the most amazing appliques on it. I'm going to try and show you. It's really big, so it's really hard for me to get it up on the table. <laughs> and uh, so you can see, it's just a little something extra. This is, you know, it's amazing. And this would just be a blue caftan with some checky trim. But the, the applique is what makes it pop. And you don't need to applique all over it. Just little bits. Little bits really goes a long way. Um, on top of that, you also have panels. So there's a, a Valkyrie image where she's like this. She's holding her horn. She has her hair in her hair knot. She has her shawl. She has her dress. And then she has this straight thing going straight down underneath these big balls that are supposed to be beats. That's a panel. So panels, um, if you check my Viking one-on-one -on -one class is basically like just that little something extra. It's the thing that takes, you know, from, you know, a seven to an 11. It's just a little extra bit. And you know, these, you can pretty much just switch out. Like you can wear the same outfit, change your panel, and then you have a totally different outfit. It's different. Or you can take the same panel and you can do stuff to it. Like put on some Posamont which if you don't know what Postmont is, it's basically uh, it's, the best way I think to describe it is just making a bunch of knot work with silver tentrad. Uh, that's the material that I've known to, that, that I know about anyways. And you just do a whole bunch of knot work and then you put it on your panel and it adds a little bit of extra. Or if you don't have Postmont, that's okay. If you took my stamping class, I explained how you can take little bits of material, stamp it, and it turns into trim. But guess what? It can also be used on a panel, like so. And you can put it on the top, you can put it on the bottom, you can put it on the sides. You can change what is a beautiful panel into another piece of art. And you know, there's things always adding, always changing. It depends on what you want to do with your panels. Um, there will eventually be a panel making class specifically in how you can take some linen and turn it into an amazing piece of art that you can wear and you will feel like a million dollars. So from there, uh, oh, give me one second. I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties, they are a thing. I do apologize. So that's just some basic clothing embellishments. There are many other things that you can do. You can, again, my friend of the West made this, it's beautiful. You can just basically do little bits of embroidery up around the neckline. I mean, if you're wearing a Viking, you're gonna have uh, you know, your, your underdress and then you can have this beautiful embroidery just around the neckline, just a little bit, and it's perfect. It's that extra little touch that brings everything together. Also, you can take just basic scraps. Let's say you have this beautiful color linen or this beautiful color silk, and you have just enough to not do a big thing, but just enough to where you don't want to throw it away. Don't throw it away. There are so many things you can do with it. You can embellish your clothes by just adding a, a fat piece of trim. This is one of my favorite wool aprons. And I just took some leftover silk 
I made some thick bias tape. And now what was just my blue apron, I have the perfect little piece of silver. And it's just an extra added pop. So it makes me happy and it makes my fabric stash happy that it doesn't feel like it's gonna get wasted. What you do? All right, next, we're gonna touch on some jewelry. Because who doesn't love jewelry? I love jewelry. I don't think you can see my whole table, but it is filled with what I've collected over the years. So first, we're gonna start with necklaces and torques. I mean, they're, they're kind of included. So necklaces can add so much to what you're wearing. Um, not everything I'm gonna show you is historically accurate. Uh, just because a lot of it is sort of kind of interpreted the way that I would understand that they had this material, they had this material. There's not an excellent find, but I bet you they use those materials together. Uh, case in point, one of my favorite necklaces I made. So this is made with bone beads, wood beads, antique glass beads, and a bear claw. Now, I don't know about all the rules here in the East Kingdom, but um, where I came from, I was able to source legally a bear claw and the materials that are used with it. Um, together, I made this into a really pretty necklace. And then I doubled its use so where it could be a festoon. And the festoon is the bling that goes from uh, boob to boob. There are more necklaces made with uh, glass beads and wood. And then there are also more necklaces that are just basically amber strands. There are torques that you can get. A friend of mine made this. When I say a friend of mine, anytime I say it, I pay them. I pay my artists. So that's it. Um, this is a Gotland sphere necklace. It's beautiful. Um, that is based off an extant find and it's recreated and it's recreated beautifully. Let's see, uh, you can also mix your materials in case in point. I have no proof that this existed, but it's black amber, it's glass beads, it's uh, silver pendants, and a couple of gauntlet spheres that Cullen got for me for my birthday. I put them on a necklace and some extant fine beads. So this period, this period, this is all period. Did it all go together? I don't know. Am I trying to prove that it was a thing? Nope. Do I like it? Yes. Yes, I do. And that's one of the important things about anything that you wear. Are you happy wearing it? Great. Be happy wearing it. Is someone else not happy? Tough for them. You know, unless you're trying to pass it off as documentable, don't give a fig. Uh, another stones that were used were carnelian. Um, so there's amber and other precious stones that were used. Uh, one, one of my favorites other than amber and crystal is carnelian. It's this beautiful orange color. And it pretty much can go with almost anything that you're wearing because it adds that little pop of color and it's just, it's, it's delicious, it's delicious. But this specifically, this is one of my Slavic necklaces. And I say it's Slavic because I asked the artisan, I'm like, hey, artisan, I want something that's Slavic. And she can provide so much documentation on the lunula, on the cut of the carnelian, on the length, on the way that it was designed. I'm not there yet but I can find the information if you want it. Um, so other than that, uh, like I said, there's you know the glass beads, the amber and other precious stones, bone wood, there's the silver, there's bronze. There's so much materials out there for necklaces. If, if, if you find it, just put it together and put it on. Cause that little extra bit makes everything come together. Or like, you know, in modern days, they have that statement necklace. Make your statement necklace. 
Or if you're not a necklace person, it's okay. Go for festoons. So festoons, like I said, they're the things that go from breast to breast. And they're generally held up by some form of brooch. Um, so again, the brooches uh, are what you wear with an apron dress. They go there. And then I have my festoons permanently affixed to bead hangers. Bead hangers are not necessary. You are able to just loop some tiger wire and string your festoon and loop the other one. And as long as you have a good crimp, you know, you can put that one loop and that one loop on the brooch uh, pins and then pin it on and you have just the one. Just if you like go more than one or two, it's really not feasible. And I highly recommend getting bead spacers. So this is my festoon that I have permanently affixed to my brooches. I have glass beads. I have chain. I have a shadow lane over here on the side. And that's my festoon. Now, there are some people, and I would love to be these people, who have like several different festoons. They have ones that have seashell. They have ones that have amber. They have ones that have glass beads. They have ones that have bone beads. They have the silverfish. And they're like just a bunch of solid fish all put together. And it's beautiful. If you're talking about a statement necklace, that's the way to go. But you don't have to go that route to up your guard game. You can go down to Joanne's go to the bead section and you can find some lamp work beads or you can go take a class in lamp work beads and make your own. Or you can go find an artisan who is being stricken with this whole COVID thing and not being able to go merchant and you can patron them. There are all, all sorts of ways that you can get what you want to up your guard game from no matter what your budget. Budget generally is not an issue in that. So when I say shadow lanes, remember, shadow lanes, things hanging down over here from the bridge. There are all different types of things that can go on your shadow lane. Uh, it can be a knife, which, I mean, that's kind of honking, but it's a thing. You can do it. I wear it. Um, it can be an awl. It can be an ear spoon. It can be... A uh, comb, it can be scissors, it can be a needle case. Um, this one was made and it was made out of bone. It can be made out of bronze, it can be made out of iron, it can be made out of all sorts of different things. And there is research out there that each one of these things generally has a representation. Uh, for example, if your chatelaine has a key on it, like a key to undo a box. That means uh, that you're hospitable. Or if there's, oh, I'm sorry, not that you're hospitable, that you're the, the, the head of the house and that you have the key to the house. Or if there's a meat strainer, that one means that you're hospitable. I don't have a meat strainer that's next on my list though to get. Um, there are several other things out there that represent so many different things. And as soon as my handout is together, I promise I will list a few more in there so that way you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, we've covered necklaces and festoons. Uh, we've covered clothing embellishments. Um, there's a, a few more things that we can go over. Uh, the brooches, I showed you the brooches for the apron. Uh, these are penennular brooches. These would generally close your the top of your gown or tunic. Um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This one is one of my favorites. It's a little bit bigger than a quarter, but definitely smaller than a 50 cent piece. And while it's big, it's a statement piece. So if I don't have a necklace that I'm wearing or I'm not wearing you know, my, my favorite festivities, I'm just wearing a set of brooches, I might wear this. It's just something to like a little bit of pizzazz. Um, or I can go with my honkin' honkin' brooch, my, my, my honkin' honkin' penumula brooch. And this one right here, I use to hold my furs on. Um, so if you have a fur, there's a really nifty way that you can put it on. And you'll basically loop this through the eye hole. And then you'll be able to secure it to where it's not falling off your shoulders and driving you crazy. Because I don't know about you, but it drives me crazy when they fall off. Um, there are also 
trefoil brooches, which are beautiful little trefoils. Um, my big one's on my coat, so I can't really get one that to see you. Uh, but they come in all sorts of different sizes, so you can wear them all sorts of different things. This one, again, statement piece. Wear right there, close your tunic. Or some people... Sorry. Oh, Sheva, we have a question in the chat. Sure. Um, which is, uh, could you just include a picture of the the festoon holder? Could you just hold that out in your hand a little bit closer? Of the bead spacer? Yes. Yeah, let me bring it up to you. So this is just one version. There are several different bead spacers out there that can hold three, five, seven, ten, one um different little spacers uh this one in particular i got from a vendor at great western war um but you can go on etsy or you can talk to any of your local artisans and say hey do you have these and they will most likely say yes or i know where to get those or no not yet but i'm making some super easy there's also a really easy way to do it on your own as long as you have some wire and that is just take a length of wire curl each end towards each other bend it in the middle and then curve those out and then you're going to have two little holes so it'll do like this it'd be like a little curve and up and it'll curve that way uh, sort of like the omega symbol if that makes sense so you can do that at home if you just need them like right now but right now you have plenty of time to practice i'm sure I don't know about you, but I do. Um, so let's see, where was I? Uh, sorry, well, one more question about the spacer. Yeah. Um, uh, Rosie asks, do you know if that's a replica from Burka? Um, so this particular one, I don't believe is from Burka. I'd have to go back to the actual um, artisan that I bought it from because I don't necessarily buy things because oh, it's from this and this fine. I buy them because they're pretty and I really like them. Um, but I can definitely find out specifically about these if they're from Burka. Uh, when my handout comes together, it will have images and pictures of what was found at certain sites. Um, so just for you, Rosie, I'll make sure to include a bead spacer that was found at Burka because I do believe there is a couple. All right. So from brooches and penennulars and uh, those things, we are going to move into a couple different areas before we move to what you put on your head. Um, so there are many, many, many different types of things that you can accessorize with. Um, this is braided wire, just a simple little bracelet. You pop on and I'll be honest with you, I wear this during the day. Like I take it to work. I wear it to work. I think I wore it for like two years straight when I very first got it because it's one of my favorite bracelets. Um, this is also, I believe, braided copper, but then there's an extra strand. This is based off of an extant bind. This is also, by the way. Um, same with this one. It's just a different material. That's silver. And then this is a money ring. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the term money rings. These were used as methods of payment because they were so quickly and easily made. And they're just able to be like, oh, here, here's your money. Um, there's also different things that they do, uh, like rings, for example. Rings were methods of payment. Uh, silver rings, uh, bronze rings, you know, paid for whatever it was you were buying. Uh, they didn't just always carry around coin. So the term money ring literally meant here is your payment, but I don't want to give it away. I don't want to pay anyone. I want to pay people for it because it adds to my garb game. It or adds to my franchise, which I love. Um, also our arm rings. Now this arm ring specifically is not an excellent find. The stamping is based off of excellent finds. The runes are based off of excellent finds, but this one was made specifically for me. Um, but arm rings, definitely period, definitely wore them. And when you're out on, let's say a field 
and your water bearing, you aren't going to be wanting to wear your gorgeous festoon and your gorgeous panel and your gorgeous apron. You're going to want to go out there with an underdress and a belt because there are sweaty fighters doing whatever it is that they're doing while they're not fighting, while you're trying to give them water. You don't want to get that all messed up. So this is a way that you can just slip it on, go out there, do your thing, and you have an extra little thing to up your garb game, even when you don't have a lot of your other stuff on. Statement pieces, maybe. Pieces that make you feel pretty, definitely. All right, so now we're gonna move on to like one of my favorite parts. Cause I can talk and talk about jewelry. I can wear a lot of jewelry, but I really love keeping my head covered. Why, Sheva? Why do you like keeping your head covered? Because I'm from Alaska and I get hot really easy. And I learned that keeping my head covered can A, keep me cool, uh, in, at, like at Penzik, or during the winter, of course, it can keep me warm. So when you're upping your garb game, head coverings really help. They, they help in that they bring a cohesive outfit together. It's like putting a cap on it, you know, it keeps it all together. So there are these things called Jorvikuts. These things were found um, in Jorvik. Uh, they generally had ties on the corners. Um, I don't like ties just because it drives me crazy. Um, but when you'd put it on, like so, and you have like, let's say a circlet, or you don't even need a circlet, but you have it on and you have your whole outfit together. It just brings everything on point. And these things can be made in different sizes. So this one's small, but I made an especially large one for when I'm out on a really sunny day. And I'll tell you why, because it's like having a ball cap on and keeping the shade. Again, I don't have ties on it. You can have ties, but your bit cuts, super easy to make. It's a rectangle. It's a rectangle that you finish around the sides and you finish this way and boom, done. This is just a whip stitch. That's just a blanket stitch. It looks like a million bucks. It's quick and easy to make. And it's something that gives you instant gratification when you're trying to up your guard game. Another way that you can up your guard game is making a Skoldaham hood. Now the Skoldaham hood was based off of, uh, well, it's not based off of, I'm sorry. It was found on a body that was in the Skold Harbor. And this guy, like, I don't know, maybe a thousand years ago, fell into a bog and he died, of course. But the bog perfectly preserved his clothing, his hood, his pants, his shirt, and thus we have a documentable piece. Now, the Skoldaham hood is really easy to make. There are several different ways that you can make it. For me, the easiest way to make it is with one long rectangle and two squares. And I've taught a class on this. If we want to do that, we can. Um, I won't go through the actual construction right now. But this hood, it Basically, you put it on and you can have, you know, a, a tunic that you bought on Amazon that uh, you really like, but it just maybe doesn't keep you warm enough. It doesn't keep enough sun off your chest or you want to keep your really, really nice tunic that, you know, your significant other made and would probably kill you if you ever got anything on it. So you want to wear your hood while you're eating. This is a documentable piece that can up your guard game. You put it on with whatever outfit you're wearing. And it's pretty much just, it's there. You'll see a lot of fighters that wear them. Um, I've made them for my house to where they're big enough to put over a helmet. Um, if you have a house, make a bunch of them for your household. It's a way to show that there's a household uh, unification going on. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the most wonderful things ever. It's one of the first things that I actually made and made well. So I will sing those praises all the time. Um, going on, there's other ways that you can up your guard game. Uh, there's a Viking head wrap. 
There's a Slavic head wrap. Um, both of these use a, um, a kerchief, which I, I've demonstrated in Viking 101, so I won't do it again here unless there was someone here that hasn't seen it. And then I will go ahead and show you how I do my head wrap really quick. But if not, we can move on. Um, does, did anyone need to see how to do the head wrap real quick? There will be another class on just head wrap specifically, just so you know. Looks like we're good so far. All right. If anyone changes their mind on their way, just let me know. It's really easy to go. Uh, so for a Viking head wrap, you would use your kerchief, which would be the first layer. You would do your actual head wrap with your veil, which is generally, I'd say, like maybe 24 by 60 is what I generally use. Uh, that gives you enough play to do with whatever you want to do. And then, you know, some form of weaving or other type of headband to just sort of, you know, secure it on. Uh, for Slavic, it's a little different. Uh, again, it's the kerchief, the 24 by 60 or more, again, depending on what you want to do. And then that also has your woven headband, but it also generally has like some form of temple ring. Um, so this is known as an Ochali. And if you don't weave, you might have friends that do or know artisans that sell it. Um, but you have your Ochali and then you have your, uh, your temple rings. Now you can have one ring, you can have two rings. You can have one small ring, one big ring. You can have no rings. You can have all the freaking rings. But what I will say is when you make your first Ochili, and a really good friend of mine taught me this, is sew in a little piece of suede onto your, uh, your weaving. Because that will make it to where it doesn't go like up and down, up and down, squeeze, squish, squish, and then do this thing. It keeps it in place, which is nice. So uh, my little hint and tip to you that was kindly passed on to me. And now I've returned that kindness and passed it on to you. So, uh, you know, there's more things that you can do to keep your head warm. And one of my favorite types of hats are null band hats. Uh, null binding is a documentable form of um, basically a... Is it Viking knitting or Viking crochet? I think it's knitting. Knitting. Knitting is with the two little hooked needles or one little hooked needle, right? Yeah. So the, whichever one has one little hooked needle, null binding is the, 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 the pre-existing form of that. And these are amazing. You can do, they have all sorts of different types of stitches and they keep your head warm. And when you're outside and you have it on and it's in, you know, it's cold out, you know, not only do you look smart, but you look nice. You have your hat on and it's a knob bound hat. And so you can be like, yes, yes, this is perfect. This is a documentable piece of clothing. And you can proudly say, yes, it really, really is. And now there's other things that you can do to keep warm when you're outside uh, in order to up your garb game and not wear, you know, modern things, which is totally cool. Wear modern things if that's what you got. But if you have a little extra, you know, maybe you learn how to null bind some mittens. Mittens are always good. They keep your hands warm. Um, or if you know how to tablet weave, you know, make yourself a shawl. And uh, a really, really beautiful artisan out of Ontario made this. And it's just an extra little thing to up your game. Yeah, I have a jacket. But if I can wear this... While I'm outside with my garb, A, not only do I look more authentic, but B, I look really put together wearing authentic things. So it's just simple little pieces, one piece that can really up your garb game, bring your garb game to the next level and really make it uh, more fun and enjoyable for you because you'll become that person who's like, oh, I love the weaving that she wears or oh, I love that hat that he wears. I want one like that. And that happens. And then not only 
do you have, you know, people emulating what you wear? I mean, it's the best form of flattery, but you have people coming up and talking to you and you have more interaction with the people around you, which is what the society is all about. It's about you getting to know each other and having fun together. It's a thing. Um, another thing that you can do to basically, you know, keep your head, shoulders, knees, and toes warm is uh, winnegas and garters. Um, so if you don't know what winnegas are, winnegas are the uh, leg wraps that men wear around their calves or women, sorry, men or women wear around their calves when they are wearing uh, either Norse or Rus or Slavic, uh, which by the way, none of those are the same. Um, but you'd wear your Winnegas, you'd wrap them, and then you'd have a garter to wrap around. Now, there are some people that have several different pairs of Winnegas or garters. Uh, there's no right or wrong amount to have. Um, if you're one of those people who know how to do this, you probably have several. Um, however, just one is fine. Uh, it's sort of like, a, so pretend your set of Winnegas is your underdress. You only have one but you have several panels. Your garters can essentially change up your guard game over your Winnegas. So these Winnegas, I could have like six sets of garters for, and it changes them each time I wear it. That's a bigger guard game. It's being able to have a nice selectable piece and just continuing reinventing it. Um, so you That's pretty much it with those. Um, other than there's many different ways that you can get Winnegas. A, like I said, you can have them woven for you. B, you can buy them. Um, C, I think one of my friends' very first set of Winnegas was an old army blanket that they cut into strips and sewed a couple pieces together. And it's wool. And so they just made Winnegas from those. So you can have whatever budget and you can do these things to up your guard game. Um, and if you ever like Sheva, I really, you said this wonderful thing. I want to be able to do that, but I'm on a budget. I will help you find a way. Trust and believe. Uh, so from there, you know, you pretty much, you have your bags. Well, Sheva, what do you mean you have your bags? You have bags. Bags will not only up your garb game, but they'll be functional. So there are different types of bags. Um, I only have two examples. I have a Hedeby bag and a haversack. So my haversack, uh, my really good friend made for me. Um, and it's basically, it's a, a rectangle material that is folded up once. And then the flap just sort of kind of folds down over. And she threw on some ankle weaving and boom, she made me a bag. She did some embroidery on it for me. I have an even more awesome bag now. Uh, head of you bags. They're pretty much the same thing. It's a little rectangle of material. You have generally a uh, head of you bag because of the head of you handles because that's where it was found. It was found in head of um, And this little bag can carry things, but just carrying it ups your guard game. It's like, you know, buying a new purse, you know, there's modern uh, purse makers now that I was like, Oh, I really love that bag. People say that in the SCA too. And it can be about a heavy bag or a haversack or a pouch or whatever. But these little bits just add some of that pizzazz. Um, this is another how to be bag that someone made for me because they're amazing. Again, the head of handles and it's a bit bigger. But just as functional, and it's something that ups my guard game. Um, if you wear a belt, you don't want to carry a heavy bag or a haversack, which, by the way, haversack is both sexes. It can be for he, she, they, whichever one you are. And here is something that you can wear if you wear a belt. I don't wear a belt. Uh, Cullen wears a belt. 
Um, so there's all sorts of different pouches. This is basically a rectangular piece of leather sewn with a little patch here and a little pouch here. There's bag. Um, there's this bag, which is an excellent find um, that Cohen put together because he's extra. And again, just little pieces that you can put on that make your outfit, it, it tunes it up, which is amazing. Because, I mean, who doesn't like to feel amazing in what they're wearing? And then on top of that, who doesn't like to be complimented on it or asked, I really love what that is. Where did you get it? How can I get one? I love bling. I like to feel pretty. Uh, Cullen likes to feel handsome. And if there's anything on here that you saw that you like, you're like, Sheva, I really want to find that. I will tell you where to go get it. Um, I will also tell you right now that there are many artisans out there who really need your patronage. So if you have the budget, please support your local artisans. Um, especially during what you're going through right now with all the events that are canceled, it's really important that we do stick together. And if I can make myself feel prettier. I will. And I'm going to go get some more bling. So. Sheva, we have a question about yeah. uh, the Hedeby bag. Uh, how would that have been worn? Was it a crossbody or over the shoulder? No, so it could be both. Um, I wear them both ways. I actually keep a longer rope on both of them. So that way I could do either. So this one I can wear crossbody. Or if I tie it up, I can wear it over my shoulder. This one I already have tied up because I prefer to wear it over my shoulder. Um, because my, my friend who made it for me, she made it with rope. So it's very uncomfortable to wear crossbody because it sort of kind of digs into the neck. But that's because I use and abuse my bags. Like I put everything in here. These things are so strong. It's ridiculous. My haversack is probably even stronger. But I, I, I'm a sucker for bags. I need to add more to my militia. Maybe we should make bags. Oh, no. But if that is all the questions we have, which if there are any others, now's the time. Because I have shown you almost my entire treasure trove. I have more. But I'm not going to dig it out. <laughs> uh, there is another chat question. Okay. Um, someone has asked, what are your feelings on wire weaving? On Viking wire weaving? I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, it's an extant form. There's so many things that you can do with it. You can make necklaces. Um, you can wire, Viking wire weave over uh, a stone and make it into a pendant itself. I just, I personally don't own any, which is really surprising. Uh, actually, no, I take that back. I do own a necklace. Um, however, since I moved, I haven't been able to find it. And I hope she doesn't watch and learn that I have lost it. <laughs> Which I'm going to find it, I promise. <laughs> um, but no, I love any form of accessory. Uh, I have friends who literally have probably 10 times the amount that I do. And could probably tell you a gazillion facts about each of their pieces. Whereas me, I just like to share and if you ever ask a question, I can find the answer. Um, but as it is right now, uh, that's pretty much all I have for this class. We're going to be doing more classes. We're going to be doing uh, uh, actual head wraps. Like I'm going to teach you how to do some really nifty head wrapping um, that works for Viking or Slavic um, or anything else that requires a head wrap. Um, and then we're also going to be working on panels. Um, oh, I knew I was forgetting something. So is there any interest right now in learning how to make a fitted garment? And the only reason I have it in Viking 201 is because in 201, we're trying to up your garb game. And sometimes upping your garb game includes giving yourself shape. 
which a lot of tea tunics, they don't give you shape, but there are ways to do shape. So if there's interest in that, I can definitely share that with you real quick. Yes, there has been a request for that. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a quick question about beads before we do that? Of course. So, okay. I Festoons are awesome and I know like nothing about Viking. Um, so for some reason, the beads intimidate me. Like what types of beads are like specifically Viking? Should we look just for lamp working or like what makes a good Viking bead? So what makes a good Viking bead would really be it's a really tough question because there's so many things that make a good Viking bead. Uh, because it, they didn't just use beads, but if we're going just glass bead specific, right? Just glass bead specific. Yep, um, yep. I would go for shape. Um, so, uh, Viking glass beads were very, uh, I don't know if geometric is the word and I'm scared if, you know, someone I know is watching, they're like, no, Shabba's not that. Um, but for example, uh, I'm going to bring a couple around so give me one second and we're gonna sort of kind of go over some beads so the first means we're gonna go over is what you can find at joann's so this bead right here i don't know if you can see it very clearly but it's a yellow round bead with what looks like little white flower petals you can find those at joann's they have all sorts of different colors um, same with this little eye bead, this little yellow eye. This is, you know, a period bead that you can find at Joann's. Um, same with this black bead with the white swirl and this white bead with the yellow dots. Those you can find at Joann's. And the, all the things that they have in common is they're very cylindrical and they have geometric shapes on them. Um, so like I said, most of this festoon right here is Joanne's beads. Now, there are some very precious ones to me that my knight made and my knight's lady made, and I have a little dangly bit on there. Um, this is one of my very first festoons. Uh, when you're looking for Viking beads, not only are you wanting to look for round cylindrical shapes with you know patterns on them or nothing on them, you're also wanting to look for even clear beads and what you call a melon bead, which is one bead with some cuts sort of kind of into it. So it looks like it's three. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not a melon bead. This is a melon bead. And it's cylindrical and it has cuts into it and it's going up and down. So it looks like a pumpkin. That's what I can pretty much akin to it. Um, but these beads, a friend made. And... Uh, they are based off of excellent finds. And you'll notice they look like giant seed beads. And so you're just sort of kind of looking for beads that A, speak to you. And then, you know, beads that look like they're fun to play with. Like, I, have you guys ever heard of a fidget spinner? Yeah. I fidget spin my beads. <laughs> Like my best do is long enough to where I'll sit there and I'll just sort of kind of twiddle my thumbs, but I'm not twiddling my thumbs. I'm twiddling my beads. Um, I can't say there's any one thing that you should look for. I should say the one thing you should look for, if I had to say you need to look for this one thing, is you need to look for what you like, what you want. And while it's totally intimidating, I get it. I was really intimidated my first time. But let me tell you how much fun I had going into a uh, merchant's booth at my first Penzik. And I was in that bead booth for like three hours just playing with beads. Like, oh, I like this one. I like this one. She gives you a little box and you just keep them separated. And you're like, oh, I like these. And then, oh, I like how these look together. And you're just making something for you. So if you're intimidated by what kind of bead, I get you. But if you're being intimidated about, well, what should I put on it? You should put on it what you want. Does that answer your question at all? Yes, that's awesome. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, so when we're putting a garment together, everyone knows how to do a tea tunic. I'm assuming. Ish. Right? 
Sort of, kind of. Okay. There is a pattern that basically you have your tea tunic, but then you add two extra pieces right here and your gore, your side gore turns into two pieces instead of one. And I'm going to show you. Um, and doing this makes it to where your garment is more fitted to you. So if you have a bigger bust and a smaller waist, this will help make it look like you actually have a bigger bust and not a huge waist or, you know, a waist and, you know, no four boob going on if you're a female. And I'm going to show you. So this right here, can everyone see that? This right here where my thumb is, is where my sleeve is meeting what would become my gore. So here's my waist piece. Here's what became of a gusset. I've now made it into two pieces that are sort of kind of, um, they're not rectangles anymore, but they're rectangle-ish. I'm not a math person. There's a shape for it, and I don't know the shape name. But you're basically making it wider up at the top, bringing it narrow at the bottom, and then your gore has now become two pieces where it matches up here. And then it flares out. And this, what this does, and anyone let me know if they're interested in taking a class in this, is it gives you more bus space, but actually makes it look like you have a waist, which I don't know about you, but I went for my first 20 years of SCA with no waist, none. I knew I had a waist. And the only way I could get a waist is wearing a belt. And I don't know if I made it clear, I really don't like belts. So having a waist is very important. And when you're upping your garb game and you're really wanting to bring your garb to the next level with, without just accessories, but actually bring your garb up to the next level with your accessories, having fitted garbs, garments, it's amazing. It makes me so happy. So if there's interest in actually learning this pattern, I will definitely teach that class. I don't know how well it will do online. Um, I could also work one-on-one -on -one with some people. But this method right here is the best method. Um, I've had two people teach this to me. I've taken so many notes. Uh, someone actually took my notes. And uh, she's like, can I use this as a handout? I'm like, yes, that's like the biggest form of compliment ever. It's like, can I use your notes as a handout? I'm like, yes, yes, you can. Um, so I'm yeah, so Sheva, people have expressed interest in that. So absolutely. Beautiful. Well, we'll definitely uh, work on that also. Um, so if there are no other questions, I'll wait just a second to see if you have any more. Um, we'll probably go ahead and wrap this up. Um, in the meantime, while we wait, if anyone has any questions, I just want to once again thank the Ministry of Arts and Sciences for putting together these classes. It's really nice to see our community come together, um, especially during what we're going through. Um, and, you know, thank you for, you know, taking time out of your day to come to the classes and support your artisans. Um, I really, really appreciate you guys. And I really appreciate the officers in the Ministry of Arts and Sciences. You guys are amazing for putting all this together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheva. I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think we can call it a wrap. I will stop yeah. recording. Thank you so much. You're welcome.